All right, well, my phone says 1130. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to everybody. We are so excited that you've chosen to join us today. Um, here on the screen, you see a couple reminders. All your microphones have been muted. Um, and then there may be a, a slight delay as we move through the slides. So just be prepared for that. If you have any questions as we go through the presentation, you can type them right into the Q&A box. Um, if it's something that we think should be answered right away, we'll answer it right away. But if it can wait till the end, then we will wait till the end. Um, but we'll make sure to allow plenty of time at the end for questions for anybody that has some. So before we get started, um, I just want to take a moment to introduce myself. Um, but actually, I just want to say thank you again to everybody who's able to be here today. We know it's a wild time right now in the world. So we know that finding time to do things and learn about what you're interested in is, is very important. So thank you for taking that time. And also thank you to SunTrust for sponsoring today's Lunch and Learn. Now I will introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Sam Valentine. I am the Events and Rentals Coordinator here at Conservation Foundation. I oversee our events along with rentals for anyone who's interested in using Bay Preserve for their own special event. I am a Florida native. I grew up outside. I absolutely love being outdoors and I know how important it is to protect these special places, um, especially if we want future generations to be able to enjoy them the way that you know we have uh, growing up here in Florida for those of you who have grown up here or those of you who may be visiting, um, made this your, your home now after a few years, How, whatever the case may be, whatever brought you to Florida, whether you were born here or not, uh, if we wanna protect these special places because they are beautiful and they are fast disappearing. So we're gonna be answering some questions like those that you see on the board, uh, the board, the screen. Um, and you're gonna be hearing from three Conservation Foundation staff members today, myself, our Director of Land Protection, Debbie Osborne, and our Environmental Programs Coordinator, Sabrina Cummings. So before we dive into these questions and start telling you all about Conservation Foundation, uh, let's take a quick moment for Sabrina and Debbie to introduce themselves so that you know who you're hearing from. So Sabrina, let's start with you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Sabrina Cummings. I'm the Environmental Programs Coordinator here at Conservation Foundation. Uh, I'm also a Florida native. Um, my general area is all of our environmental programming, specifically our next-gen conservation programs, which you'll hear from me a little bit about. And I'm Debbie. I'm Director of Land Protection. I've been with Conservation Foundation for a seven and a half years, but I've been doing land conservation around the country for over 30 years. And I moved to Florida to take the job with Conservation Foundation and I fell in love with it. And I feel so privileged to be able to save the very special, beautiful places we have here in our community. So I will continue to talk about um, Conservation Foundation. And first a little bit about our story, who we are. This is our vision a future where the human and natural worlds of Southwest Florida flourish together. We were started by a group of residents in the Sarasota area back in 2003 that knew how beautiful and how rare and special this place was. So they came together to form a new nonprofit organization, a land trust that would help protect these important places, the, the Gulf Coast bays, beaches, barrier islands, and the watersheds that feed these waterways, um, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. We wanna make sure that those to come after us still have places to experience and see the beautiful natural beauty of our lands and our waters and develop deep connections to them. And that's part of what Sabrina does and you'll hear more about them. It's not only saving the land, it's connecting you and others to them. We work um, throughout the Southwest Florida from Tampa Bay to the Everglades, primarily along the waterways of the Manatee, Mayaca, Peace and Caloosahatchee rivers. Next, Sam. So what is a land trust? It is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to save land and steward land appropriately and build a conservation ethic within the community so others want to participate and help 
save land and save the character of their community. There are many land trusts across the country and in Florida. There's about 1400 across the country. We have 26 here in Florida. And we are one of the larger, um, more active land trusts within our state. Um, and each land trust is different. It's unique based on what the resources are in the community, what the community tells us they want to have protected, why it's special. Those are the places that we look to conserve. So um, land trusts have been very effective, particularly when they focus on those opportunities that the community is passionate about. And land trusts across the country have been able to save about a million acres a year. I'll say we're so thrilled with that, but that is much less than is being lost every year to development. So our mission and our work is critical and we appreciate your support today and listening to what we do. Sam? So as I said, each land trust is um, unique based on what they've decided is important. And we spoke, we uh, worked with our community when we did our strategic plan about five or six years ago and asked truly, why? What do you wanna see conserved? And first and foremost was waterfront but that's salt water or fresh water. That's along our bays and the Gulf, but it's also along the rivers because our water quality is so important. Imperiled wildlife, these special um, plants that these wildlife can, um, are dependent upon. So it's not only the, the animals, it's the places that they need to prevent them from becoming extinct. Connectivity, so the map on the right Yes. Um, uh, all the green spots are properties, uh, lands that have already been protected by a variety of organizations, the federal government, the state government, our county governments, and private nonprofits. All the little numbers that you see there are projects that we helped protect. And you can see that many of those are on the boundaries of the already protected lands because what we're trying to do is connect them up, make sure that there are corridors for wildlife and for people. And then we also uh, look to protect unique public access. And I can't see you raise your hands, but if you have um, not been to our headquarters at Bay Preserve um, on Little Sarasota Bay in Osprey, you'll see that that's a unique public access component. We don't have to be the Parks Department here in Sarasota County and Manatee County and our surrounding counties have wonderful parks that the county takes care of. But when there's opportunities that we can provide something special, like the historic house in our place at um, Bay Preserve that you'll hear more from Sam later, that's a unique public access. So those are some opportunities that we're also working on. We know that not every piece of property can or needs to be protected. So we need to prioritize and these are our priorities. And we've been pretty successful. So far, we've protected 47 properties with over 18,000 acres. I can't remember what that is. It's like well over uh, 18, 19 square miles, I believe. So um, it is a lot of land and we are, again, thankful that so many people have helped us be successful in protecting those properties. Next. So why does it matter? Well, I think you know, that's why you care about it. That's why you're listening today. And that's probably why you love being in Florida or you moved here. It's about the environment, the special resources that we have here in Florida. Some of them are scrub jay, um, is one of those endemic. It's only found here in Florida. So we're responsible for making sure that there's habitat for that um, very special bird. So it's the environment, it's wildlife, but it's more than that. We all love to get out um, in nature. Um, it's important to recreation, to recreate. It's also important for our health. We know that getting out on the land, experiencing nature is good for people of all ages, for our mental health, as well as our physical health. It creates vibrant communities when we have important natural lands that are integrated in our communities or within walking distance of our communities. And finally, land conservation is a critical part of our economy. Um, tourism, 
ranching, recreation, um, our residential communities are all critical to our tax base and um, tourism and recreation to employment within the state. But I will say, so it's important um, to think about the economic importance as well, that while we're buying land, we're also getting a lot back from that land. And most important, overarching, probably the most important thing in Florida, the way that this state is um, formed, it's our water. It's our surface water, it's our groundwater, it's the water surrounding this peninsula that we live on. It is, uh, land conservation is one of the most important tools to ensure that we protect the water quality, our drinking water, as well as the water that we enjoy playing in um, and wildlife need for survival as well. So it's really about the water, 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 Sam. So how do we do it? Well, there's two main ways. We can own it or we can protect a piece of property um, through conservation easement. And I'll talk about both of those in more detail and give you examples. We can also, well, we can own it, we can buy it at its full fair market value, which is getting more and more expensive here in Florida. We can get a bargain sale if the landowner is willing to sell us the land or a conservation easement at a discounted price, that's called a bargain sale, or they can donate it. We love donations of land and conservation easements. And for bargain sales and donations, there are really, really excellent tax benefits um, that have been um, enhanced and made permanent uh, by the federal, by Congress in a bipartisan, um, almost unanimous effort because they recognize that the work to save land is critical to the health of our country. So many of our projects, in fact, I'd say all of our projects are partnerships. We couldn't do it alone. And I'll show you some of our creative partnerships and also community conservation. Again, those projects that aren't really habitat or water um, focused or based as to the reason why we're conserving it, it's because the community has said, this is important to our community. So I'll show you examples of all of those. Sam. So Conservation Foundation actually owns 10 properties for about 700 acres. When we, we also have helped other public agencies um, and other nonprofits um, acquire land that they own and manage um, for conservation. When we buy a piece of property um, and Conservation Foundation is gonna be the owner of that property, we not only have to think about getting those dollars for acquisition, we also have to think about having the funding and the resources to own, manage, and in some cases, restore the properties that we protect. So let me go um, through some properties that we do protect and the ones that eventually you may wanna enjoy uh, again. Go see Bay Preserve at Osprey. The four and a half acres on Little Sarasota Bay was a bargain sale where the landowners gave us a substantial donation. They also donated money for that endowment that helps us manage this very expensive, um, important historic and natural resource. Pine Island at Matt Lachey Pass is 230 acres down on Pine Island on the Matt Lachey side, um, this part of the Blue Way uh, the canoe trail, kayak trail around Pine Island. It's very close to uh, National Wildlife Refuge. It adjoins a county park that we help Lee County acquire. And there's other protected lands in the area. Our 230 acres is a mix of mangrove swamps right on the water, um, as well as upland, formerly grazing land that we're now in the process of restoring with native grasses, wildflowers, and longleaf pine. We're hoping that it'll be open in the next year or two as we um, get the permits that are required to put in the public access infrastructure. Um, and then it will be a beautiful place for you to come and visit. The property, the picture of the little bird, you see that little bird? Um, it's kind of hard to see and that's the whole point. Uh, that is a snowy plover um, on Siesta Key Preserve where we were donated about an acre of land right on the beach, just north of where the parking area is for Sarasota County's you know, big um, uh, 
uh, Siesta Key Beach Park. This little acre um, supports this tiny little bird. And the bird is tiny, even smaller is right in front of it is this little chick. So what we're so pleased with the property that we own, even though it's an acre of land, we've been able to keep the sandy um, soils, it's not all overgrown with um, various grasses to make sure that this remains a viable nesting site for the snowy plover. And in fact, except for the last um, year or two with red tide and, and then the hurricanes, our site was one of the most prolific um, site for hatchlings and fledglings here um, in Sarasota County. There's only about 200 nesting pairs left in Florida. And so we're so happy that we have a partnership with Sarasota Audubon and they rope this property off during prime nesting season, which is also prime beach season during the summer so that we can keep this bird safe. And we can also work with them to educate people about why it's so important. And so the property on the picture on the right is the, our most recent acquisition of 363 acres of wetlands at the headwaters of the Mayaka River adjoining the 2,300 acre Flatford Swamp Preserve owned by the water district, Swiftbud. We're in the process of um, removing invasive plants and we're hoping to acquire some adjoining land so that we can improve and provide access to the property. At this point, there is an access. There is access through um, at the adjoining Swiftbud property, but it's a spectacular piece of property with clear flowing streams, and we've already found rare and endangered and imperiled plants on the property. Next, a conservation easement. So we know that we can't afford, and neither can any public agencies afford to buy and own every piece of property that should be conserved. So there's this fabulous tool um, that land trusts use across the country called a conservation easement, where the land remi remains in privately private ownership, but it is permanently conserved by this legal document that tells you what can and cannot be done. And it's perpetual, it's forever. It's recorded with the deed on the land. So it is binding on every subsequent owner. So each conservation easement is negotiated specifically with the landowner depending on what their long-term needs are for the property, as well as what the resources are on the property that need to be protected. And we have a variety of conservation easements. Um, one that was donated is a small golf front piece of property on Casey Key that is, as you may see, all the little orange um, plastic lines. It, it's a very uh, important place for the sea turtles to nest. So um, it is where, even though there's been lots of storms and the Casey Key and um, is changing shape as all our keys are, that's supposed to part of what they do. There is still significant land there for the sea turtles to nest. So that's a conservation easement donated on private land. The next property is Pepper Ranch Preserve. This is a 2,500 acre preserve in Collier County. And Collier County donated to us a conservation easement over 1,500 acres, the most natural acres on the property to ensure its continued use by the panther. And um, they also, they did it for a variety of reasons because they know that um, almost everything in Collier County is either protected or is going to be developed and they needed some additional um, community county owned facilities in another part of the county. So they did this in mitigation in lieu of, um, to ensure that this would be forever protected. No future government could undo it. And it would then enable them to um, build the government buildings that they need to have. This conservation easement we hold, but it has oversight with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because of the importance of this property and the rarity of, of course, our 
Florida Panther. That was again donated to us. Now on the Mayaka River, just north of the north entrance to the state park on Mayaka Road and Clay Gully Road is 1100 acre conservation easement that we helped acquire from the Carlton family who'd had the ranch for about 100 years. What's so unique about the property is it has three miles of the Mayaka River flowing through it right at the western edge of Manatee County where it hits the county line flows into Sarasota County and becomes a designated wild and scenic river. So it was so important to maintain the quality of the Mayaka River in Sarasota County by protecting what's upstream. And having a piece of property with land on both sides is very rare. So we were able to purchase a conservation easement using money from the water district, Swift Mud, um, and they hold the easement, but we raised an additional $1.3 million to purchase the conservation easement from the Carltons, and then they sold the property subject to the terms of that easement that only allows three houses, two additional, three additional houses um, than the one that was already there um, on the 1100 acres, protects the river and um, regulates grazing on the property and is now owned, um, was bought by a conservation buyer who's using it for ecotourism and ranching. And um, it truly has made a difference in the water quality, reducing the herd of cattle from over 400 to 160. Significant difference because they were in the river. So um, that's what a conservation easement can do. It can, it can enable the land to stay in private ownership. The people on the left, they have their house, they look over this piece of property, but they protect it for the turtles. And the property on the right is just one example of a big ranch land. They get to continue to use their ranch, ranch it sustainably, but use it for recreation, ecotourism, and just loving the land. So that's what conservation easements do. Again, each one is negotiated based on what the resources are on the property and what the land um, owner wants to do with the property. And then it's up to the holder of the easement, such as the easements that we hold. We have um, 12 properties under easement for about 1,875 acres. We are responsible for monitoring those annually, um, at least once a year, um, and enforcing the terms of the conservation easement on the current owner and all subsequent owners. These are forever, and we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Next. So partnerships. Again, there probably isn't a project that um, we have done that isn't a partnership with the community, with funding agencies, with the landowner, but sometimes it takes a big partnership, pulling all sorts of resources together. So there is this piece of um, these, on the right, you'll see these four pink uh, lots outlined in pink. Um, this is on the Braden River. Um, before it flows um, down to the reservoir and into the Manatee River. Uh, the kind of yellow highlighted area there, uh, just south of the downriver from the pink lots, um, is Linger Lodge. Um, if folks uh, had ever been to Linger Lodge, I'm not sure if it's open right now. Um, anyways, those four lots, the one on the, the furthest west, uh, was bequeathed to Conservation Foundation by a gentleman, Carl Bergstresser, who didn't want his land ever sold for development, left in his will that he wanted to be, it to be protected. And we were willing to accept that and take that responsibility to protect it forever. We then um, were working with the community and Carl Bergstresser was very involved with uh, the neighborhood surrounding the other three lots that had been purchased for development. And we went to the landowner, the developer, and said, will you sell the property to us? Well, it was Neal Communities, and he's a very practical businessman, and he goes, you give me what it's worth, I'll sell it to you. I make as much money by selling it to you as I would over time um, building all these houses. So we um, got the property appraised, and we were, um, he was willing to sell it for $3 million, which was the appraisal value. The community tried to implement a funding source where uh, they would pay for it, but that was kind of difficult for $3 million. So Manatee County, out of their general funds, said to Conservation Foundation, we'll come up with $2 million if you come up with a million dollars. We did within 10 days. 
um, that shows you the support from the community. We were able to, uh, Manatee County was able to buy that property. They then donated a conservation easement on us, for, to us on that property so it can never be used for anything other than the nature preserve. We then donated to Manatee County the 11 acres and hold a conservation easement on that. So Manatee County now has a 44 acre preserve with conservation easements that we are responsible for enforcing. And we work very closely with the county. We have conservation easements on several of their properties because they know that the, co count, the community, their voters instructed them to do this and they don't want future commissioners to undo that. So this will be protected forever. Next. And then Orange Hammock Ranch. We can't wait till this is gonna be open to the public. And we hope it will do, um, be that in a year or two. So this has been the property in the red um, within the city of Northport, right next to a bunch of green. To the right is RV Griffin Reserve, which is our drinking water reservoir for the entire region. And north of that is private lands, Longino Ranch, protected with conservation easements, Walton Ranch, which is a county preserve, an additional um, conservation easement, Deer Prairie Creek, uh, all the way up to Mayaka River State Park. That is 120,000 acres of protected land right in our backyard. Well, this red blob of um, almost 6,000 acres was at one point going to be three, um, let's see, 3,000 homes and 1.5 million square feet of office and retail. The community had for decades been trying to protect the property. We got it on the Florida Forever list. We worked with Swift Mud, with the county, with the city of Northport, trying to pull the funding to get together. And about a year ago, we finally got the call from Florida DEP secretary that says, okay, we have money in Florida Forever. We wanna buy Orange Hammock Ranch, but this, we can only buy and pay for 90% of the value. We will come up with 19 and a half million, if you, Conservation Foundation, will raise a million and a half dollars. We had four months to do that during COVID and we were successful again because of this community. So thank you. Um, it is managed um, by FWC. It will be the newest um, wildlife management area and the first in several in probably over a decade. It's a spectacular piece of property that helps protect the drinking water, not only for the city of Northport, but for our region and protects really, really special imperiled habitat. So that's another success. That was a partnership, again, thanks to this community. Next is community conservation. And um, again, just a couple of projects. The one on the left, we are very pleased to, again, at the community's urging, um, working with Sarasota Audubon and the folks that live out near the wonderful celery fields, another place to go if you haven't gone, were these four undeveloped looking parcels that um, were at one point slated for surplus by the county for industrial development, which is what surrounds it. The community said, no, you can't have that happen. And um, fortunately, the, um, and so we were just kind of looking at the South East quad um, square closest to celery fields below the, the sediment control pond. Um, and the, a little over a year ago, the county commission said, no, Conservation Foundation, we're gonna give you a conservation easement on all three of those quads outlined in red. So we've been working very closely um, with the county and Sarasota Audubon. We were successful in getting the conservation easement donated to us by the county in October um, that allows for um, improvement of the stormwater pond with some public access opportunities on that north parcel, on the southeast parcel. That'll be restored for improved bird habitat, different than the bird habitat that is available at Celery Fields. And then on the left, there'll be a county um, building that will potentially house the library and a historic, um, the history center, and will allow for some additional visitor amenities and reforestation. So again, we're working with um, Sarasota Audubon, a fabulous partner, to bring that to um, fruition. And you'll 
hear soon about our fundraising campaign that we'll be kicking off. The Bobby Jones Golf Course, um, we've been working again with the city of Sarasota to reduce that 45 hole golf course to um, 27 holes and create a 140 acre park. So this spectacular property is not just available to golfers, but it's available to all of us and the habitat and the water quality will be restored. It's very important because it flows into Philippi Creek, which is an impaired water body that flows into Sarasota Bay. So we're really excited about that as well. And the Venice Urban Forest is, uh, we work with Babby, a great um, community group, Venice Area Beautification Inc. Um, that's done so many things, but they had this vision of creating a forest along the Venetian waterway, the intercoastal that separated Venice Island from the mainland. And um, they've, um, we've helped be their fundraising partner to bring in the money necessary to restore this ugly industrial site into important native habitat. So those are just some of the community projects. We're always looking for more. If there's something special in your community you want to let us know about, and we'll see if we can help. If there's a land protection or land stewardship component, let us know and we'll see if we can help. I think that's it for me. Oh, maybe there's one more. Oh, there is one more. Funding. Never enough. If we have a limiting factor, if we can't do everything I want to do, it's because there's not enough money. Um, and we're very pleased that we worked with, again, the terrific um, Manatee Fish and Game Association, uh, Trust for Public Land, and a number of other organizations and individuals to pass the referendum and the November elect, uh, election that created a dedicated funding source for land conservation in Manatee County. And what's so important to know is Manatee County is the only county on the coast that didn't have a dedicated funding source. So like Sarasota County has 30% conserved land. State of Florida has 30% conserved land. Um, Charlotte County has 40% conserved land. Manatee County had 13% because they had no money. You know, the one, that rare difficult project that we put together on the Braden River, you know, they had to take general funds and they will now have a dedicated funding source. And um, it passed by 71% of voters, which was more, and it passed in every precinct. And that was a higher rate of um, approval than any candidate received in their um, election. So we know that this is a important to all the residents, almost all the residents, most of the residents of Manatee County, and we look forward to working with Manatee County to save more land. I will say that in the next few years, Sarasota County will be renewing their um, land acquisition funding. Charlotte County will probably be doing the same, and we will always be looking to make sure that the state's Florida Forever program is fully funded so we can do and save all the important properties that we know need to be saved. Okay, Sabrina. Well, that's me. Uh, hi again, everybody. My name, just for a recap, Sabrina Cummings. I'm the Environmental Programs Coordinator here at Conservation Foundation. Um, and talking from what Debbie was just talking about, uh, we talk about community conservation a lot. Um, and in our talks about community conservation, we talk about perpetuity. We talk about how the easements that we have on land are forever. Um, and we really want to get the community involved. And for us, one of the best ways to get the community involved, other than to get them outside, is to get their kids outside. Uh, we're all here because we love land. Uh, we love the outdoors. We love the water. Uh, some of us love the bugs. It's a whole thing. Um, and that love lasts a lifetime. Um, Education is really a pillar in community conservation. Um, it's educating our landowners on the things that pertain to them. It's educating the public on the spaces that they can go to and why we do the things that we do. Um, but for kids, we're really starting from the beginning. Um, I was a kid who grew up right here in Sarasota County, grew up dirty all the time. Uh, there's always dirt under my nails now. Um, and that really started from a kid and now I'm here uh, still with a, a lifelong love of the land. Um, so today's kids are really those denizens of the technological landscape. 
um, always on their phones. I know we hear a lot of, you know, back in my day, our parents used to let us outside and then we came back when the lights came on. Um, and kids today live in a very different time. Um, and we've had a lot of science that tells us that the more kids are outside, the better off they are. Um, research shows that the more kids are outside, the more quality time they get outdoors. Um, they're generally happier, they get better grades, and they're long-term more invested in the world around them. Um, they're more invested in the dirt, the bugs, and the water that they can fish, fish in, uh, drink, and swim in. So the benefits for educating them uh, are not only uh, in the moment, but are again for the future, um, continuing the whole perpetuity thing. Um, so Next Gen Conservation is our umbrella program um, for youth experiential learning outdoors. Um, it emerges a two-part system in 2019 um, to provide a range of experiences to youth. Uh, the idea is to engage and really get them excited um, through hands-on activities. Um, Sam, if you go to the next slide, please. So we started with our Youth in Nature program. Um, started in 2017, this program was made to give you those real wow moments uh, to the youth outside who historically lack access to nature. Um, so these are kids that live, say, in more urban areas. Um, they're cut off from, you know, a, a real a real outdoors park, the real woods, as, the, uh, as we've been told, um, or aren't given as many opportunities to get into those wild spaces or even the moderately green spaces that make up significant parts of our counties. Uh, we work with about 13 community partners, um, some big ones that you'll see. Uh, the girls on the left are from Girls Incorporated, which is really fun. Um, we work with the Boys and Girls Clubs locally. Uh, we work with our local Easter Seals. Uh, we also work with Tidewell Hospice and their Blue Butterflies program, uh, just to name a couple. And we really get out there. Uh, I've been on some adventures. Uh, it's sometimes as big as getting them into our state parks. Uh, the Girls and Girls Inc. on the left are at Oscar Shear. Uh, and it's even getting to places that are really close to where they are physically, but they don't always get to go. So the kids on the right are from Laurel Civic Association and they're at the uh, Laurel Garden that's run by the county, really, really close to where they go for their after school program. So pretty much they'll come with me, you know, a couple hundred yards and all of a sudden they're outside, you know. Um, my job is to really get them jazzed about the outdoors and the things that they can do outside. Um, my whole job is stories. Um, so particularly this year, uh, we've been working really hard in our garden uh, and the kids at Laurel Civic, Civic specifically are really learning more about taking ownership of their food production. Uh, they're learning what things they enjoy and what things they don't. Um, my favorite story so far this year has been um, because Youth in Nature is mostly youth led, their, uh, their time in the garden is mostly youth led. So I ask them, I'll give them a list and say, hey, what do you want out in the garden this year? And I heard overwhelmingly radishes. Uh, and I asked them, hey, do you know what a radish is? And they said, no. Um, I asked them if they'd ever tasted a radish. They said, no. So this year we made radishes and uh, they're getting their first tastes of things that they've heard about before. And they know the words, but they don't always know what they are. Um, this kind of exploration is really the, the crux of getting kids out and the foundation of our youth and nature program. Uh, next, please. So our nature explorers program uh, is actually for the little kids. So uh, it's an exploration program for kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, the idea is to engage small kids in community science projects uh, like bird counts or phenological surveys. So they're getting outside with their families and uh, doing some, some pretty big STEM on a really tiny level. Um, it welcomes families by enabling them to do activities as, like, as a group. Uh, youth in Nature is really about going to community partners and inviting kids outside that way, where Nature Explorers is really for a uh, more family-centric program experience. The idea is, you know, if a grandparent wants to take their kids to a state park but want to make it more engaging, we have, you know, bird surveys so that you get to go as a little family unit uh, and do the things like by yourself. But if you have questions, usually there's someone floating around to answer those. And it makes 
going to our larger green spaces a little bit more accessible uh, if you want to have something that has very specific uh, goals in mind. So uh, one of my favorite stories from the beginning of Nature Explorers, um, we had a scat like a nature scavenger hunt at Bay Preserve. Um, and I check the, the weather every time we go anywhere. And so we were ready for rain. So we stayed uh, and waited for families and families showed up just as nice, had little kids in their like, their, like rain hats and like these like boots. Um, and eventually, you know, you'd see these kids with like colored pencils and wet pieces of paper and they're looking for stuff. Um, and their parents are just standing by like, wow, I didn't know my kid was that excited to go out in the rain. The parents stay behind, uh, which is also very funny, um, but letting the kids go roam around and find things is really a big part of, of STEM, especially for children. Um, and it's also really fun to just let them hang out outside because that's the point. Um, up till now, we've had about uh, 2,600 experiences in youth and nature alone since 2017. Um, we have a lot of community backing for this. Our community partners, both as funders and as partners in bringing us children uh, have been monumental. Um, we've been working on some COVID safe procedures um, and also teaming up with the county um, to do some outdoor programming or specifically Sarasota County uh, to get some outdoor programming in ways that families can still do it, but um, safe for all of our staff. Um, it's been a little bit different with COVID um, as you would understand being outside uh, and having a a hands-on experience is very different uh, right now, but we're still chugging along and working on getting kids outside in meaningful ways. I think there's a question, Sam, let me, I'll pull it up. Oh, um, there is a question now asking how many, how much staff we have. Sam, can you answer that actually in the next section? Cool. Certainly, did you have anything else you wanted to, Tack on or you're all, all set, Sabrina? You good? I think I'm all set. Okay. Well then, before I jump into telling you guys all about Bay Preserve, which is our headquarters, so it's actually a great segue um, because this is our offices, this brick building here. And we have, I wanna say 11 staff. Um, some are part-time, so that includes like our site manager who lives on site, manages the property. Right now we're all working from home, so I'm having trouble keeping track of how many how many we've got. Um, but I believe the answer is 11. We are a small staff, and we continue to grow um, because the work we do is getting even bigger. Um, as Debbie mentioned, Orange Hammock Ranch that that's been a big, big project in the work for works for a long time. Um, so as we gain more traction within the community, people knowing who we are and wanting to support our work. Uh, the more people we need to, to help make sure everything gets done. So we look forward to continuing to grow, um, but right now we are at 11. Yes, Sabrina. Uh, for a uh, secondary question, I think this might've been a question for me. Uh, how many members do we have to carry all these programs? It's just me on staff. <laughs> I, I'm our education person, but we do have backup for things like when we go kayaking, we always have to have a second staff member on hand um, and we, I personally work very closely with other programs. Um, so for instance, Selby Botanical Gardens also only has one education person, um, but it's hard to go all this alone. So it's, it's a game of having good friends and teaming up to get jobs done. Definitely, we, uh, you know, community is very, very big in what we do and not just in our protection efforts, but in our engagement efforts and every, everything really. We are a very community-based organization and we are excited and happy to have the support of our community to be able to do the things that we are able to keep doing. Um, now I'm gonna jump back into presentation mode. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about Bay Preserve. So that is what you are looking at here on the screen. Bay Preserve is owned and protected by Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast. Um, the historic Bay Preserve home right there that you see is called the Burroughs Matson House. And that is in honor of the first and last owners. The second floor is our office space and our headquarters. And then the downstairs is both a rotating art exhibit and a um, it's part of an event space. So if you were to rent the grounds, you it would include the downstairs as well. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our 
art receptions and that type of thing when I get to the events portion of the presentation. <laughs> uh, the park itself is open to the public and is a really great place to go fishing, put in your kayak. Uh, you could come have a picnic. Under normal circumstances, we we'd actually be having this lunch and learn in the Burroughs Matson house. Um, in fact, that bottom left corner room right by the oak tree there uh, is where we would normally be meeting. We'd be serving you guys a tasty Publix lunch. Um, so I apologize that you're not getting that now, but hopefully everyone at home has eaten something tasty as you guys are watching this presentation today. Um, so normally this slide isn't even here, but just wanted to make sure you knew what we we're talking about when we keep referencing Bay Preserve. So let's talk about the history of this property because a lot of people when we meet on site do have questions about the history of the grounds. So this property was purchased in 1929 by Dr. Watersfield Burroughs, who was a retired surgeon from New York City, and his wife, Elsa Shearer Burroughs. They were responsible for the neoclassical design of the main house and the grounds. The main house structure is made of brick and steel, which makes it very, very durable. Um, it's been able to withstand weather for almost 100 years here now. The Burroughs also, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Bur yeah, the Burroughs Madsons also, <laughs> Sorry, the Burroughs also constructed the first floor of the carriage house, which is in that picture all the way to the right, as well as the boathouse. So if you were to come to Bay Preserve, this building here is actually two stories now, um, but the original bottom story there was part of the 1929 uh, building when they originally built it. And actually 1931 was the original building. So let me tell you a little bit about the Burroughs and how it's interesting that this came to be our headquarters. Dr. Burroughs was held in very high regard by the people of the region as a businessman. He owned Gulf State Motors, uh, various apartment buildings in Manatee County, and he was also the publisher of The Commonwealth, which was a newspaper where he wrote about liberty, freedom, and independence. And he was a very strong supporter of public lands. Uh, among their extensive holdings was also the South Creek Ranch, which is south of Bay Preserve, and it contained 4,000 grapefruit trees, which, I mean, to me seems like an insane amount of grapefruit trees, vegetable gardens, a sawmill, a chicken farm, and it was a lot, you know, 462 acres was the total acreage there, and when Dr. Burroughs died, his wife Elsa actually willed that land to the state of Florida. She was hoping that that would be able to be preserved for habitat for wildlife, and maybe it could even be turned into a park, which actually it was, and it was named in memory of her father, Oscar Shear. So I personally, I love that connection. They are the owners of this property, the very first people who lived here and built this house, were really big on public lands, and we have that connection to Oscar Shear State Park. And it, they understood the importance back then, almost 100 years ago, of protecting lands for future generations. So it's, it's just fabulous, I think, that we ended up in this home as our headquarters. So the Burroughs house was sold to Glenn and Betty Valentine in 1953. And to, then in 1957, it was sold again to Stuart Seaman. It was during this time that the carriage house I mentioned right there, that last picture on the right, gained the second floor, so mid-50s. Um, and then the house was not sold again until Richard and Cornelia Matson purchased the property in 1985. And then in 2005, they decided they were ready to move. They didn't need this big space anymore, right? But they knew that if they sold this property, it was in the middle of a building boom, waterfront property um, with any sort of acreage was really getting snatched up by developers. So they didn't want to threaten that historical integrity or environmental integrity of the ground. So what they did was they started looking for a way that they could protect this property for the future. And what they found was Sarasota Conservation Foundation. That was our name back, back then. Um, we are now obviously Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast. And what we did was we worked with them to uh, undertake an ambitious capital campaign to purchase, restore, conserve, and endow this breathtaking slice of old Florida. So in May of 2006, we were able to purchase the property with the help of a 6.6 .6 million Florida Forever grant from the Florida Communities Trust. And Bay Preserve now is a real testament to the power of partnership. Debbie mentioned how important partnerships are and what we do. And this piece of property is just the perfect shining example of that. You know, it was nonprofit, uh, public uh, entities, a generous landowner. We all worked together to make this happen. 
and again, that's that community that I, we were talking about earlier. It's so important to everything that we do. Um, so in 2008, the Burroughs Matson House was designated a historic landmark in Sarasota County. And then in 2009, we opened to the public. So these days, Bay Preserve is open to the public from sunrise to sunset every day of the week, except for when we close to the public for special events. So we host many of our own events here at Bay Preserve, such as our annual Palm Ball. We have Bourbon and Boots. We have Wild About Nature, Shakespeare in Nature. And I mentioned those quarterly art receptions. So you can see here on this far uh, left picture, there's some art up on the walls. We do change it out. It's been a little different now with COVID because we're not working in the office. We obviously can't have 100 people jam packed into our downstairs space to view the artwork and, and have cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. So we're, we're working through that right now, but we look forward to when we are able to get these art receptions happening again. Um, and you can see some fabulous artwork by local artists uh, related to nature and the great outdoors. And you can also check out our space and learn more about what we do. But in addition to hosting our own events on site at Bay Preserve, we actually also do rentals here. So you can rent for a private party or for something like a wedding, uh, which is what you see here in that middle picture. Uh, most commonly, that's what they're rented for is, is the wedding. So when someone rents Bay Preserve for a wedding or party, we close to the public and the grounds are the renters exclusively. So that's pretty cool. Most venues, you rent a part of their grounds. Here you get the, our entire grounds and it's just for you. Um, we are able to do that because we own this property. It is not, while it is open to the public, it is not publicly owned. So we have that right to close um, and, and do these rentals. Um, typically they're on Saturdays. So if you are thinking, I really want to come down, check out Bay Preserve, go fishing, but I'm worried there might be an event, you can always check our website calendar. Um, and it will tell you if the park is going to be closed to the public because the last thing that we want is for you to have this awesome outdoor day planned and then have a wedding make it you know not possible for you so i think it's also important to mention a lot of people think what on earth are you doing hosting weddings at a conserved piece of land like what's that all about well debbie mentioned it is not cheap to who own and maintain these properties so the weddings actually help us offset the cost we do very few weddings per year, no more than 20 at the absolute max. We try not to do them on back-to-back -back weekends, um, but we really wanna make sure that we are, are taking care of the property as well uh, and, and both the weddings that we do and all other activities on site. And the weddings here do help to offset that cost of ownership and management and make it available to the public for regular enjoyment any other time. So if you or anyone you know is looking for a beautiful location for an event, you can contact me. Um, it's also, you know, it's a great way to support your organ to support an organization if you care about the work that we are doing, which I assume you do because you're here today learning about us. Um, you can support us in just your own regular event planning world. So something to think about. Okay. So we've thrown a lot of information. You have heard all about who we are, what we do, how we do it. And hopefully now you just can't wait to get involved and you are desperately wanting to know, how can I help? How can I support you? I'm not planning a wedding, what else can I do? <laughs> um, well, there are a number of ways that you can get involved. You can participate in, in programs, so like you are today. Um, you can, learning about organizations such as ours, as well as other various environmentally focused organizations, it's a really great way to learn about your community about how you can help to conserve nature, protect our valuable natural resources. The more you learn, the more you help, uh, you can help others learn. And that's what's important. People believe things when people they know are telling them. So if you wanna learn and educate your community, that's gonna make a big difference. And we definitely encourage you to do so. Participating in programs is a great way to take that first step. You can also volunteer. So there are a lot of different volunteer opportunities um, most of the time. I will throw that caveat there because right now we are very limited in opportunities due to COVID as I think a lot of organizations are. Um, but I'm going to give you this information as if we're back to normal. So we normally have four different categories of volunteer activities. There is our opportunities out on the land. So if you want to get dirty and sweaty and you know, uh, flag native trees or pull invasives or flag gopher tortoise burrows, you know, help dredge paths, 
um, that have never been there before. Whatever type of outdoor volunteer opportunities you're looking for, we do have all different kinds um, that you can get involved with out on the land. You Maybe you are not interested in getting dirty and you would rather help out at an event. You want to put on some nice clothes and talk to some people. Well, we have opportunities for that. Our event volunteers, we are always looking for. Uh, one of our big organization or big events every year is our Wild About Nature Festival. Uh, it's how I first actually found out about Conservation Foundation. And I was a volunteer on the Wild About Nature Committee maybe four years ago now. And it is still to this day, my favorite event. It is about a thousand kids out here at Bay Preserve having a blast. Uh, we invite all these different organizations from the community with environmental focuses or youth focuses. And it's just a free fun day for kids to get excited about nature. Um, there's, not other, there's not a lot of events like that here in our community, um, especially one that brings together so of many of the different organizations. So I personally love Wild About Nature. And it is a very, very heavy volunteer lift. There's also, like I mentioned, those art receptions. Sometimes we need volunteers at those. So lots of different event volunteer opportunities. Again, in normal times. Um, if you would rather help out with the kids, like Sabrina mentioned, um, it's just her. She, as she said, she is the educator. But if she has a group of 30 kids, they need backup. So maybe you want to go kayaking or go climb trees with kids or hang out at a park with kids. You're going to learn just as much as they are uh, about the different plants and animals and bugs and wildlife and just crazy things that are out there in the wild. So that's always a good time if you like kids and being outside. And then maybe all of that sounds just terrible to you. And you like the great outdoors, but you would rather work in air conditioned at an office and you just want to put on your headphones and sort some papers or stamp some envelopes. You know, we need office volunteers too. Again, during normal times, we're not working in the office right now, but there are a lot of opportunities that we will have for you in the future once we get back to regular life. Um, so if you're interested in any of our volunteer opportunities, the, the tab that you logged into Zoom through to start this program when you leave here, it's actually gonna be on our volunteer signup page. So you can click right there on that tab and you can fill out the form right there and say, I'm interested in helping out with events and land or I wanna do office stuff. So if you have any interest in our volunteer opportunities, that's a great way to sign up. And what we will do is we will email you when these opportunities arise or when if, you know the opportunities that are in line with your interests arise. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely sign up and keep an eye out for emails in the future. That was a lot about volunteering. Um, you can also donate. Uh, so maybe you don't have the time to, to volunteer, but you have, you have the funds to support the work. You want to help make sure that those kids can get out there. You want to make sure that we aren't scrambling to, to find sources for the next big uh, piece of land that we want to conserve. Donations are always, always appreciated. You can also donate, as Debbie mentioned, a conservation easement on your land. If you have some spectacular, or even maybe you don't think it's that spectacular, but it, we might see some incredible value in it, um, check that out. Your land donation is also a really, really great way to leave a legacy, perhaps even a legacy of land. As you can see, that's the next <laughs> bullet. Um, you can also support funding for land conservation. That Manatee County bond referendum, that happened because people supported that funding. So look at when you're out there voting, we will never ever tell you who to vote for. We want you to do your own research, make you know decisions that are in line with your beliefs. But if you believe in protecting land and saving nature, make sure that you are looking at people who protect land and wanna help save nature and that those initiatives um, to dedicate funding for land conservation, that you're supporting those types of, of opportunities. And then last but not least, you can tell your friends. So that is the word of mouth. I mentioned this earlier is the best type of marketing there is, right? If your friend tells you about this amazing new organization, you're going to be more likely to believe them than if you just happen to be scrolling and see something, you know, on Facebook or an ad on digital media somewhere. So if you tell your friends, I learned so much at this awesome lunch and learn today from Conservation Foundation, I highly recommend you check it out. The work that they're doing in our community is fantastic. Uh, they're probably gonna believe you because they trust your opinion and they trust who you are. So tell your friends, you can like us on social media. You can invite your friends to like our page. You can tell them about upcoming events that we have. There's a lot of different ways that you can support our work. 
these here, what you see on the screen are just a few. And if you have other creative ideas on how you might be able to get involved or support our mission, we encourage you to reach out. Our website is conservationfoundation.com. If you go to the staff page, it will give you little bios about all of our staff and it also has direct email addresses. So if you are thinking, I need to talk to Sabrina, I've got some cool ideas, you can find her email address right there on the staff page. Um, if you if want to talk to me about some great event ideas, my email address is right there. We're ready. If you have a piece of land that you think is the next big piece of land that needs to be saved or a small piece of land, reach out to Debbie. We want to hear from you. Community is very important to everything that we do. And we thank you so much for being here today and being part of our conservation community. If you're new, thank you for taking the time to learn about us. If you've heard about us for years and you're finally taking the time to learn a little more, thank you for that too. And if you are one of our avid supporters and you just wanted to see what this Lunch and Learn was all about, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we're gonna see, it looks like we have a question here. Um, it says, my daughter, poor. Uh, when is the ideal time to get kids involved in youth outdoor programs? And thank you for your efforts. Well, thank you for being here. And Sabrina, do you want, I mean, I, my answer is any time is a great time to get them involved. Same. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I'll just say, I personally, I have a one and a half year old also, and he is an outdoor baby. Um, we, he can now identify palms, oaks, and pine trees, and we are learning about roots. Um, so he points out roots. So I would, I, my answer is that it's never, ever too young. Um, if you wanted to get them involved in our Nature Explorers program, that would be the first step. Um, it's typically K through five, but I think we could probably make an exception for, I'm, I'm sure it's a, you know, a cute, smart little four-year-old that's ready to learn. Sabrina, anything you want to tack on to that? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, get, when we uh, get back to doing Nature Explorers, just stay tuned uh, on both our Facebook and uh, to our website um, because those have slots in them just to keep everybody safe. And I'll add to that point, our Facebook page and our website are great ways to learn about all the things that we're doing. Um, upcoming events, we'll always share them in both locations. And uh, you can learn more about different big projects, things that we've got going on. You can learn about all of our past projects on our website. Um, if you it's, a, it's just a, a wealth of information. So if you've got some time to poke around online and learn about some of these properties and why we protected them, what made them valuable in the, you know, the priorities that we look at, I do encourage you to do so. If anybody has any other questions, um, now is a great time to ask them. We are just about wrapped up here. So we'll just give another second in case anyone has any other questions. And uh, during the this time, Debbie or Sabrina, if either of you have any closing remarks you'd like to throw in, I invite you to share those, but no pressure. Yes, um, uh, gosh, I had to go look and make sure it was still there. Um, also to that last question, I think it'd be good to download our field guide for fun. Um, last year was all about nature festival. Um, in lieu of a normal festival where, you know, kids are running around and, you know, eating snack. Um, or whatever it is kids do for a day. It's very exciting out there. Um, we made a field guide. A bunch of community members pitched in, um, with a lot of community partners that usually would have been there, um, but instead submitted um, content for a field guide. Um, and that is under, uh, that will be under Next Gen Conservation on our website at the very bottom of the page, um, slightly bigger than all the other texts. So I would definitely get started there. Um, so you have some like, structure to get your kids outside. And I will just say, I get, you know, I get calls all the time and emails about um, special places, properties that people know of in our community that they think needs to be protected. Um, often when I get the call and the trees are already cut down and the developers there turning it up, it's a little late. So that's why be proactive. If there's something left in your community that your community wants and loves, let us know and we'll see if we can help. All right, thank you both. And I don't have any other questions coming in today. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again so much everyone for being here and we hope to meet you in person sometime at a future event. Thanks. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs>